huge pleasure to be here at Jaipur Lip Fest in London. Um, and an even bigger pleasure to interview someone that I've known about throughout the whole of my Indian life because my family lived there for three and a half years. We've only just got back. And yours was the first book I read heading out there and read again as, as we left. My kids studied it at school in Delhi. So it's informed many of the ways that we've actually experienced the country. So personal thanks to you. And for those of you who don't know Catherine Boo, she's a, a renowned investigative journalist um, with a background of working it with excluded communities, with, with poor people, um, first in her native United States and thereafter in India, where in your words, um, you fell in love with an Indian and gained a country. Um, and shortly thereafter began working on this extraordinary project, if I can describe it as that, where you spent the years between 2007 to 2011 immersed in a tiny community on the side of a toxic lake of sewage. Uh, not many journalists go that far. I mean, you just go the extra mile. You've been described by the New York Times as a prodigy. I would describe you as an example. An ancient prodigy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> just a prodigy. They didn't, uh, yeah, they didn't Big add anything news. to it. Um, but uh, yes, I would describe you as, as an example to all journalists in your, in your sort of scrupulous tenacity at sticking with this story. Um, which has since, I mean, I'm sure you've all bought copies, but if you haven't, it's available outside. It's been dramatised by David Hare and performed at the National Theatre, which I can't quite imagine because it's so very much alive on the page. Mm. Uh, we'll come to that later. Okay. Um, so here it is, Behind the Beautiful Forevers, Life, Death and Hope in a Mumbai Under City. Talk to us about the hope. It's you know, my... my editor and my agent were so despairing of this book when they got the manuscript. They said, you know, where's the happy ending? Where's the slumdog millionaire who, you know, gets the girl and the money and the, um, where's the hope? And I'm like, you idiots, the hope is there on every single page. And it's the hope, the hope is the intellectual capacity, the imaginative force of individuals in communities that most of us, most outsiders only think of as these sort of dehumanized masses. Um, and that is the hope. And so what I'm trying to do in my work is get close enough to the individuals um, in those communities so that readers can see what I see on a daily basis in my work, which is just, you know, what, what this world could actually be if we unleash some of this talent instead of systematically oppressing it. So talking of talents, could you introduce us to one of your key characters, Asha? Uh, we've just been talking about her backstage. Oh, okay. Asha's a, a, a wonderful person, and again, it's, it's testament to your to your sort of scrupulous journalistic ethos that I selected a section for Catherine to read out, and she came back saying that she wanted to frame it in a way that introduced Asha in a more complete sense. Mm. It just shows how sort of um, defensive you are, or how protective <laughs> you am. feel about defensive your Defensive is an okay word, yeah. So please introduce us to yeah. Asha. So I'll just say that I, I just just as background. I mean, one of the things that I really felt. You know, all, all reporting and writing is in some way a reaction to the reporting and writing that has come before. And one of the things that uh, was problematic to me is the ways in which women were often written about as if they had no agency, as if they had no volition, they were done to, they never acted. And what I was seeing and what I see in poor communities around the world is women are often driving forces. Um, they are thinking about their children and the next generation and they are um, living and working with, with profound creativity to improve um, their children's chances. So I wanted, and I knew that even if, even if I didn't do it well in the reporting, I knew that if I could give an account or, or multiple accounts of women in their complexity, um, that it would be, you know, it would be like a few drops in a very dry lake at mm. least in the, in the literature. Um, so Asha grew up in, um, acute poverty in Badarba. Some of you will know where that is, agricultural community. Um, and it was gendered poverty. When food was short, uh, the girls were the ones who didn't get fed. And she is scarred by that poverty. She, was, she ended up in an arranged and disastrous marriage to a thoroughgoing alcoholic. And she has this amazing daughter, Manju, who is poised to be the first female college graduate in the history of that Anawati slum and it's close it's in sight she thinks how can I get there and 
she's a member of Shiv Sena, a fundamentalist right wing party based in the state. And um, she's thinking about how power can translate into her daughter's college education. So I'm just going to read three passages. Now that Asha was older, her eyes drew more attention than her breasts. She could weaponize them in an instant. Boys caught gaping at her magnificent 19-year-old daughter, Manju, would reel backward as if they'd been struck. When Asha thought about money, her eyes narrowed. She thought about money most of the time, and Awadians called her squint behind her back. But the real distinction of her eyes was their brightness. Most eyes dulled with age and disappointment. Asha's eyes looked far more radiant now than they did in the photograph she possessed of her youth. A tall, stooped, emaciated farm girl with sun-darkened skin, freshly embarked on that disastrous marriage. When Asha looked at that photograph, she laughed. She had since seen past the obvious truth that the city was a hive of hope and ambition to a profitable corollary. Mumbai was a place of festering grievance and ambient envy. Was there a soul in this enriching, unequal city who didn't blame his dissatisfaction on someone else? Wealthy citizens accused the slum dwellers of making the city filthy and unlivable, even as an oversupply of human capital kept the wages of their maids and chauffeurs low. Slum dwellers complained about the obstacles the rich and powerful erected to prevent them from sharing in new profit. And everyone everywhere complained about their neighbors. This development increased the demand for canny mediators, human shock absorbers for the colliding, privately construed interests of one of the world's largest cities. Over time, of course, many shock absorbers lost their spring. But who was to say a woman, a relative novelty, wouldn't prove to have a longer life? Guilt of the sort that had overcome the previous slumlord was an impediment to effective work in the city's back channels. And Asha considered it a luxury emotion. Corruption, it's all corruption, <coughs> she told her children, fluttering her hands like two birds taking flight. Lately, a government-sponsored women's self-help group looked somewhat promising, now that Asha had figured out how to game it. The program was supposed to encourage financially vulnerable women to pool their savings, make low-interest loans to each other in times of need. But Asha's self-help group preferred to lend the pooled money at usurious rates to poorer women whom they'd excluded from the collective. <laughs> the manual scavenger who just brought her a sari, for instance. Still, when foreign journalists came to Mumbai to see whether self-help groups were empowering women, government officials sometimes took them to see Asha. Her job was to gather random female neighbors to smile demurely while the officials went on about how their collective had lifted them all out of poverty. The magnificent Manju, her daughter, would then be paraded in as Asha delivered the clinching line. And now my girl will be a college graduate, not dependent on any man. The foreign women always got emotional when she said this. The big people think that because we're poor, we don't understand much, Asha said to her children. Asha understood plenty. She was a chit in a national game of make-believe in which many of the old problems, poverty, disease, illiteracy, child labor, were being aggressively addressed. Meanwhile, the other old problems, corruption and exploitation of the weak by the less weak, continued with minimum interference. In the West and among some of the Indian elite, this word corruption had purely negative connotations. It was seen as blocking India's modern global ambitions but for the poor of a country where corruption thieved a great deal of opportunity, corruption was one of the genuine opportunities that remained. I think I, the, re the reason that we, we alighted on that passage in particular is because I wanted you to talk around the ideas of how... Um, the, the, the white gaze, if you like, mm. of foreign people coming in and, and what they perceive, even with the best will in the world, how they perceive India. And it's very hard to know what filters are, are, are at play. Mm. Uh, you, you, you flip that there. And, uh, and what we think is corruption and is necessarily a bad thing is not necessarily so 
for Asha, right. certainly, and for her daughter. Can you talk about how, how, how you experienced that, how these kind of, these uh, iconic notions of, of themes like corruption were, were turned on their heads? Well, I think, you know, I, I, one of the things that strikes me in almost every community that I work in is that, for, for me, the problems of the <coughs> poor are, to a large extent, the problems of the rich and wealth. But the conventions of journalism often invert this. They say that what journalists are, are set up to do is to only validate the solutions proposed by the rich. Um, by instead that you of, mean coming in and going, oh, isn't it lovely? Look well, at the, Howard Girls. Bankers or, or, or bankers in the microfinance, that's, you know, that's, that's an idea, a solution at the time. It was considered one of the solutions to, um, to poverty in, in the world. Um, so the journalists come in and try to validate those solutions instead of listening to people in the communities about what it is that they think they can make better. And it's, um, you know, so it really gives you this lopsided cosmos in which the, the solutions are the things that, that don't really threaten the people who have a lot. Um, the solutions are what's palatable to the wealthy, often white majority. I um, mean, they may have nothing to do with what people actually want in those communities. So you, came, so you came at it from this very different angle than other journalists have, another way of engaging. Um, can you describe as well just the, the sort of daily routine? I mean, it was years that you spent doing this research. Mm. You know, you get up on a morning in a presumably <laughs> quite nice house and walk into this place. How did that day unfold? Well, it was, there was no nine to five in it. There was no ordinary day. What you do in this kind of work is you go to a place and you settle in. And it was really important to me to meet a diversity of people. I didn't want to just write about Asha. I wanted to write, Asha, Asha was one of the most privileged people in the slum, and certainly her daughter was. I wanted to write about the people who, who um, made a living buying and selling recyclable waste. I wanted to write about Muslims. I wanted to write about OBCs. I wanted to write about SCs. I wanted to, um, you know, to widen the universe because that's the universe as it's experienced in a single place. I mean, too often as journalists, we pick the the most virtuous, the most super talented person True. to tell so their to stories. Diverse, but how, so just describe to us the going into the place and you know the, physically how it was for you on a daily basis going in and um, becoming part of a community in a way. What what I think that you, you with the journals you have two ways of going in. You can sort of charm people or or you can go in and sit down and say I do this really ki weird kind of journalism and this is what I do and <laughs> are you you know, interested in participating in this. And one of the things that I think that people don't necessarily recognize when, if you haven't done this is that people in communities like the ones I've written about recognize full well how stigmatized and stereotyped they are. They see how people's assumptions about them outside are shortening their chances, are, are, are you know, effectively ruining their children's ability to, to change their lots, that, that this dehumanization and this um, hatred and disparagement becomes, of course, internalized. So you were trying to gain people. their trust. You say, say, you say, this is what I do, and um, and and people. I think this, there's, a, there's a woman named Zeranisa Hussein, who said, I think very early in our meeting, she said, I think if people understood our lives better in more detail, they would judge us less harshly. Um, and so that isn't something that you go in and impose as a journalist. That is something that exists. That helps you start that conversation. You also did a ton of uh, documentary research, picking through and bureaucracy, and can you describe how that process unfolded? Sure, and you know, when you ask about an average day, there were many days when I wasn't actually in the community. I was pursuing some investigative angle on that community. Um, I looked at, and the, 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 reader never, they ne the reader never knows the things that we didn't write about mm. as journalists, right? And my, I use videotape as I work and I look at my videotapes now and I'm seeing just days upon days of investigative and other kinds of research that I ended up not using because you're trying to pursue stories that aren't necessarily the, like the, the most sensational stories. You're trying to pursue stories that real, reveal something about the institutions in which people are embedded. Um, so so a, key, a key, for people who haven't read the story, mm -hmm. um, one of the key threads in the book is the trial of, and the, the accusations around, and the trial of a kid called Abdul, who's accused by his neighbor of, well, first of attacking her, and then finally he's accused of murder. Right. 
Um, and, and this is the case that kind of appears through, and it develops throughout the book. And, and there was, so, so with Abdul, I was able to explore the criminal justice system and the violence uh, and the, the lack of justice in that system, the court system. And with the case of his neighbor, who was a disabled woman, Fatima, I was able to explore the crisis of the public hospital system. Um, and so that's what you're, so you know, you're picking, when you're picking stories, it's really important. And through Asha, I was able to explore Shivsena, for one, but also the education system available to the poor, and in many cases not available because the money that was meant to educate young people was being, um, was being taken and circulated among a political elite. When I, when I first got to the, I was working in, because I worked in videotape, I would often take films of, of teachers in schools. And people, early on, people would ask me, politicians, oh, it's so interesting that you're doing that. Can I have your footage? I just want to look at it. And then I, it took me a while to realize that they wanted my footage to prove that there was a school so that they could take money for a fake school. And it, you know, it just didn't occur to me in the beginning. But, but that's part of why you don't go in and leave after two weeks, because otherwise you're not going to understand much at all. Um, and you, you, know, you think about, you know, I, I think about early in my career when I did quickie stories. And I would come back. After doing them, I tried to do them my best, and I was like, holy shit, I hope that was the case because I really didn't press hard enough. I really didn't talk to enough people. My, yeah. my feedback loop was very small. Um, and so it was that, that queasiness that I had about previous work. It must have been very hard, actually, to, to, to find an ending to this and to, to draw this entire immersion to, to an end. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think my husband would sometimes ask me, like, so when? But, yeah, you, but it's like, much? yeah, you know, but you know it when you know it when you see it. And for me, the ending of the book, I, you know, most of you probably haven't read it, so I don't want to say too much, but the ending of the book was immediately clear to me because it was, it was an ending that represented how much sympathy we have for animals and their well-being while human beings die unaccountably without... Redress. I mean, one of the things that was interesting to me um, when I, the style of writing that I, I chose, um, I wanted it to be a, a style that, you know, that really gripped you in sort of from the beginning um, with the choices that, that people had to make in this community. But some people would say to me, oh, it's a, a you know, I, I really enjoyed your novel. And I wanted to say, well, you know, when young people mm. die in this book, they're not my characters dying, these are actual people. These are actual, you know, in some cases, remarkable, in many cases, remarkable, amazing people. Mm. Um, but, but uh, you know, by thinking of it as a novel, is also a way of distancing, distancing yourself it, yes. from any obligation to do and anything about it. In terms of that distance, I want, to, I want to return to the character of mm -hmm. Abdul and the kind of frustrating and maddening turns and twists that his legal course takes. Mm -hmm. um, one question sprung to my mind, just by the act of following up and looking at the paperwork, did your presence weigh at all on the judicial proceeding? Mm. Because as a white person, you come with a certain, and as a journalist, mm. they, there must have been at some point, I must have it was very hard that you clearly have tried to diminish your own presence mm. in this book to the extent of its almost imperceptibility. Right. But in that instance, you following up on a court case must have made someone think, who's looking out for this guy? Why is she looking at this? What's going on? But so uh, two things. First of all, you never really, you can't, I can't speak with any kind of confidence about how I changed the narrative because there's no control group. You're not sure. Sure. Um, I mean, I saw, I saw incredibly unspeakable things in the police station that you would never think that they would do in front of a journalist, and yet, <coughs> yet they did. So I think there's a way, too, that you can overestimate. Um, your presence, and I think as a woman, and a woman who's, uh, who has some physical deformities that were, you know, I think people weren't necessarily thinking all the time of me as a, as, um, you know, anybody that they needed to be very worried about. I will say that, that one thing that was clear to me, um, where I felt I really am making uh, a impact, is that, that I think that Abdul got bailed out of juvenile um, detention faster than he ordinarily would have, because um, this was the Dongri juvenile home, if any of you know Mumbai. Uh, they had just been the subject of, a, of an expose about uh, uh, people who were being held there having to drink out of toilets and having no underwear. And, and so the, when I would visit him, the warden became quite alarmed. Um, and Abdul 
told him that I was his cousin and he didn't believe it. So, um, <laughs> but, uh, so, so there was a case where I felt that, you know, that he was released faster mm. than he would have. But what was interesting about the judges is that the way that the court, it, it was a fast track court, so the judge was hearing 37 cases a week, he was one after another after another, so the judges didn't necessarily know who it was that I was following. And in that particular case, the judge that heard most of the case ended up being transferred somewhere else. And so there was a new job who didn't know me at all. So it was, it, you know, I don't think that, um, oh, and, and you know, in Abdul's case, so his, his, his I, I won't tell you what happened in the case. Yeah. There was a case against Abdul's father, his eldest sister, and him. Um, but in Abdul's case, it's still not been resolved. So my presence didn't bring it to any resounding conclusion. But did you, I mean, what, was there a conflict between you as a human and you as doing your job? You yes. Know, there must have been a point where you were just like, I'll just give, you, give them, I'll just do anything to get them out of this fix, Absolutely. you know? And, and reading it and knowing that it's true, it's really painful to observe the that just they get knocked down again and again, mm. and you also were observing this up close. And you get, really you get very, so very angry. Yeah. But, but I think, you know, one of the, so, so when you have, one of the things that you do when you have these conversations with the individuals going in is you say, the ethics of my profession are this, that I don't, I will get involved if it's a life and death emergency, but I won't get involved on in a daily basis, and that's, that it's a quite problematic ethics, but that is that I try to adhere to the rules mm. of, um, of, the mainstream media in this regard, and yeah, it feels terrible. It feel, I, when when the great actor Philip Seymour Hoffman died, he somebody said a director who worked with him said of him he hated what he loved, and I thought, yeah, that's I hate what I love too. But you also what do you mean by that? I mean because it's because there's so many times that you're feeling sickened and nauseated and you know repulsed by yourself and the choices that you have to make. You try to make, you know, in, in the moment when you're weighing between uh, whether you intervene, say, in a crisis or not, you're trying to make the right decision most of the time, but there's no, you know, I don't know any journalist who does this kind of work who feels like she gets it right does all the time. Does that, does that haunt you? Of course it does. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's it, and it makes me really, when I'm finished with the project, it is such a relief to be able to interact with the individuals that I've been reporting on is, is, you know, without that layer of distance. And I think it's a relief for them too. Mm. But, but so here's the problem. If, if, you, if, if reporters only go into, or, or writers only going into these situations with the idea that they can fix it, that, you know, that they can give out the money and the charity that will make it all better. The only literature that we have about low-income communities is literature about individuals as recipients of charity. And unfortunately, that's not the reality that most low-income people are living in. They're not in worlds full of saviors and um, heroes and saints. They're trying to figure out their own dilemmas mm. on their own. And if we, if we don't, you know, it, I, you know, I think about, a, I, I write about a burning that happens, you know, this burning of a, of a disabled woman that happens. Is it my judgment what the best course of action is to save her life, or is it her husband's? Is it, you know, is it these these kinds of questions? You you know, you you can't always assume that you have the right answer, but you you also can't just exclude the the experiences and the wisdom that people have in those communities from the literature about those communities. Mm. Um, it's 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 you know, as I as I said in the beginning about the amazing talents and capacities and insights that people have in those communities. Um, it's my, you know, even even the, 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 one of my heroes, the Italian intellectual Antonio Gramsci, he said there's no organic intellectuals amongst the poor. And I'm just like, well, no, you just didn't listen hard enough. There absolutely is. And, um, you, and did you just have to have hard enough. Patience uh, you to know, there's it. no one could accuse you of not listening. Um, and what's, what's fascinating, as I said, you, you, you kind of, uh, removed yourself from from the text from the from the texture of the the book itself, but at the end there's an explosion in your author's note where you right. you know suddenly you emerge in the first person, mm. which is quite exciting to meet you after this. And one of the questions that you ask is why don't more of our unequal societies implode? Here, these kids. There's one. There's a scene. Um, wait. There was a there was a bit I wanted to read out about. 
sort of a sense of the opposite of hope, really. Um, I've got so many markers in here. Just give me a moment. Yeah, it's about uh, what's unfolding in Mumbai is unfolding elsewhere too. Poor people didn't unite. They competed ferociously amongst themselves for gains as slender as they were provisional. The politicians held forth on the middle class. The poor took down one another. And the world's great, unequal cities soldiered on in relative peace. I there's, there's so much kind of fury in this outburst. I, I, yeah, I wrote, that, I wrote those words through tears. That's yes. In anger, yeah. Yes, I'd like to move to um, the reception of the book. It's been, you know, been very accoladed and, and wonderful reviews. How was it received in India? Um, it was, well, 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 Nandini Mehta, who was my editor there, was a great editor, um, said that it was one of the best received books of her career, and she had a long career, and she's not a bullshitter. Um, but there was, there were people who just hated it. There was one guy who hated it so much that he wrote three reviews in three different places. <laughs> and like everywhere Nothing I turned, it not was dedicated. Like, yeah, and, and you know. What and was his objection? It was, he said that the people in the books were freaks. And, um, and, and, and I think he had particular objection to um, Fatima, the, the, the disabled woman who, um, who, 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 um, who burn, who, um, and it's, I think that there was sort of an, an implicity like, well, how common was she? But it actually gets to the heart of the, my nonfiction mm. project in a way, which is that when somebody burns in a community, you're not gonna look and see if they're, she, she, Fatima took lovers. It was, she'd been so dehumanized, she'd been so, she'd been treated as an animal, her own, uh, mother was deeply ashamed at her, and, and she had used her sexuality to understand and better love herself. And um, so to me, that wasn't a freak. That was somebody struggling really hard in midlife to, to find a, a strength in it. I is, you know, strengthen her identity after. I suppose the, the question that I was leading into, mm. though, was, was it was, I mean, that, that seemed to be his primary objection, but was there also a sense of, you know, you're a foreign person coming in, making India look bad? But let's, let's, sure, no, I don't know about that. You don't, you know, I don't know the motivations of somebody like that, but I do think there is this idea, like, if you're a novelist, you get to pick and shape your characters. You get to, but as a nonfiction writer, you can't say, I'm not going to write about something because the person isn't representative, there are no representative poor people in this world, there are no representative poor communities. Um, and you know that's been a really ugly uh, a, a trope of journalism, I think, where you take specific places and you say this one place is, you know, stands in for all the other places when, when as we know, as we all travel through the world, we know that there are differences. There's, you know, that, that, that's why so many of the solutions to poverty are scale and fail because <laughs> Places are different from each other and the differences matter. But I mean, so you can say, but then there were, you know, I expected there to be more, more hostility about my writing about India. That, but that was also why we worked really hard, my husband and me, to make sure that it came out at exactly the same time in the United States and in India because we didn't want it to be a book in the West that trickled oh, that back to out, the, right, yeah. yeah, so it came out at exactly mm -hmm. the same, the same time. Um, and I think that, that that one of the things that one of the things that, that Indian citizens don't like about many books written in the West is that they don't get the details right. They don't get they they pay, play fast and loose with the facts. And well, I'm going to quote you back at yourself. Oh, okay. Um, which I thought was quite a compelling answer, where you said that you'd actually looked around to see if someone else had written this book. Had mm. anybody else done this? And nobody had. And you know, very recently, I asked my Indian journalist friends, "Is anyone doing this kind of immersive? I mean, spending years in a slum or an under city, or however we want to describe it?" And she said, "No." Hmm. So I just do. I do think that that's you know, someone had to do it. Someone has to do it, and then hopefully, for me to answer the question. Hopefully, for you. you know, somebody else will do it better, and then you know, somebody else will. You know, it's it's. But it's if if nobody does it, then then the accounts of, of what's actually going on in historically poor communities are essentially stenography for people in power. I mean, everybody, but everybody had a story about their housemate that they were taking to be the truth of what had happened after you know, the, the record growth in um, Indian social spending and 
you know, that's not that's not a way to understand what's happening in no. the community. But on that theme, on the theme of poverty, so um, people seem to assume that because you write about poverty, that you must be in possession of solutions. Um, how do you manage that expectation? <laughs> you just, you know, I mean, everybody wants a solution. It's just, you know, that microfinance thing. Wouldn't it be nice if microfinance could just take care of the whole bottom billion? And it's not right. I mean, there is no six point solution to end all poverty. There are individual solutions that matter. And I mean, you know, access to clean water, access to toilets, these, you know, there's all these crucial uh, questions of public health in, in, in um, access to, I mean, the, 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 the lack of a functioning municipal um, and effective municipal school system in most of India is, is a, you know, that, if, if, if teaching jobs weren't patronage jobs, if they were actual jobs designed to, to bring out the potential of, of young people who happen to be born without, um, without means, I mean, these would be significant, significant, um, changes in India, but the, you know, the, what's needed in Yemen might be different. And above all, I think in all the, the one thing that I think that, that most of the world has in common is that, the, um, that it's going to be the citizens who, through democracy, who bring about the meaningful changes. Um, feels it's like not going to be the, the do-gooders. The do-gooders. Yeah. Um, and do-gooders or otherwise in the audience, does anyone have a question that they'd like to raise? Um, you first. <laughs> well, I can't ask you. You're, I'm married to you, so I've got, to, <laughs> got to, <laughs> I've got to ask someone else first, and then thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hello. A few years back, a, a, a big book came out of, uh, based on uh, Bombay slum. The name of the book was Hantaram, mm -hmm. and written by an Australian convict who mm -hmm. fled from Australia came to Bombay and lived mm. in Bombay slums for right. many, many years. It, it, it related to mainly underworld, druggy, drug, and mm -hmm. those type of people. Have you read that book? Yeah, I read it when it came out, yeah. Yeah, but, but I, what, I, what, how your book differs from that book? Because that also depicts Wait, the sorry, my book slums is right? and things like it's that. It's a question, how is, how is this book different from... Well, first of all, yes, my book is yes. non-fiction, and, yeah. um, but, but mm -hmm. it's... This one's this one's no, actually true. No, that's um, also but, that is not also non-fiction. No, that it's life. fiction. It's fiction. He took elements of his own life and oh, used them in his fiction. But here's the thing, and I, this is this is something I feel quite strongly about in when I'm doing reporting in the United States as well as in India, that there has been a, a tendency, and I think it's a pernicious tendency often in in the history of poverty reporting to to write either sentimentally about you know communities where the individuals have no agency or sensationally about the drug under, you know the drug underworlds the prostitutes if you look at for instance women and the, the you know uh, nonfiction about women in Mumbai you see so many you see so many prostitutes and call girls and you don't see people who are not who, who are who are teachers or garbage sorters or those kinds of women are being left out of the Discussion, and I think there's a, you know, why do I think it's pernicious? I think because that there's a, there's, this is what we, you know, this is this is what we do to dehumanize people in those communities. We we create the idea that that um, many of those people are predatory. Um, we focus on the, the violence, the drugs, um, the the mafias, the gangs, when. And, and actually, you know, just when you physically enter slum, that's often the people that you see first. Those are the people who are on the corner. Um, but get past them, and there are many, many other people living lives that are quite different. And those ordinary lives are often seen as beneath, you know, why would anybody want to, even the people in the community that I wrote about were saying to me, why, why, why would anybody care about us? We're just ordinary people. Uh, you. Yeah. On what you're saying there, but it comes back to the original question that B asked about hope. I mean, one of the big themes of the book is is exploitation mm. of the people in the community of other weaker people in the community right. in this kind of awful cycle of kind of a predatory behaviour, mm. um, which is kind of in a way very pessimistic. Of course, you know, some of them find great success and opportunity in it, mm. but it is it is it is it's not a hopeful picture. Right. Right, but you know, I mean, I guess I'm in the, uh, I'm of the, the James Baldwin school that that you know, not everything, faced can be changed, but nothing can change until it's faced, and that, um, if if 
what's actually happening in these communities is never part of the public record. There's never, there's never going to be any pressure to redress it. And so for me, I can't control what people do with what I write and whether I can't, you know, I put it out there, it's not up to me what happens next. But if nobody tells the stories of ordinary people in those communities, you know, they're, they're, they're the grave against, injustices against them are, are never going to be addressed. There's a question here and a question here, and also welcoming questions from women. Uh, but, but <laughs> yeah, come Richard, on, you guys. But, yes, but Richard was next with a hat. Thanks very much. Um, I haven't read your book, but I will now. It's, on, it's available right here outside. Everybody get your money but ready. I have done some work in Mumbai on, on terms of developing inclusive education with mm. people from the Centre for Inclusion there who've done some amazing work in the slum of developing um, early years education, 15 centres within the, the big slum there, uh, using entirely the resources of the slum, not bringing anything in from outside mm. except the know-how which they then passed on to women and mothers from the slum, taught them how to be early years workers and Gawadi workers in, in three months, how to work with children with cerebral palsy, learning difficulty and so on. You don't, and that worked perfectly well. You don't have to have years of diplomas. You just have to have mm. the practical. They found the spaces within the slum to make the school rooms. Uh, the energy you're talking about was there. Mm. But the interesting thing, nearly all of the families that were involved were women uh, because the men have a lot of problems with having disabled children mm. uh, and that's, that's a big issue. Yeah, I read about uh, one So, And it that seems that that, that that experience fits in with some of what you were saying. Have you got any further comments yeah, on the place yeah. of disabled people, particularly children? Um, I, you know... One of the things that I always, you know, that I, I really try to get at in my work, not just in India but elsewhere, is is to challenge the easy conflation of of moral character and economic determinism. And one of the things that one of the things that was very clear, um, I, I describe in in my book two instances of people of of mothers ending the lives that they're one mother and one father ending in, in one case attempting to end the life of a, of a sick and disabled child. And you can say that that is, that is absolutely evil. Or you can also realize that in a, in a uh, community with, with, you know, with a public hospitals but no functioning medical care in reality, where even if you go to the public hospital, you have to buy drugs on the street, caring for a sick or disabled child could lead to your, the three other children you have starving. You know, so these, you know, you can't extenuate some of the things that you see, but you also have to understand the ways in which, I mean, one of the things that I, I try to get at is how, how people's, you know, one of the smaller tragedies that you see in these communities is the people's capacities, people's, you know, desires for justice, their, their desires to do good and to behave morally are constricted by their economic realities. They are robbed in many cases of what it feels like to do the right thing. There's a question at the back. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, I've had the opportunity of reading the book, and you know, it, it took me a while to realize that it was reality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and I have worked in slums in Bangalore, slum communities in Bangalore. Uh, but uh, the question that I had was: uh, most of the characters that you speak about are children and women. Mm -hmm. Was this something that was default because of? you interacting with people and it was much easier to interact with the children and, and <coughs> specific women or was it sort of intentional? How did you pick the central character, Abdul, and mm. how, how, did, uh, how did you choose to focus your uh, piece around? Well, I, I would say that, that, that two, two, two of the central characters are Abdul and Sunil who are male, so it's, but one of the things that I felt was that, um, was that, um, that many of the, there was, there was so little stability. Only, only six and 3,000 people in the community had permanent work and everybody else was just making it up as they went. And that, that, that constant sort of the serial entrepreneurship, this constant deny, you know, this constant dance to figure out what you can do and what the world needs intersects, that was exhausting. And what had happened was that many men, by the time that they were 30, 35, 
they were exhausted. They were broken. They were physically, people who did garbage work, often their lungs were destroyed, as, as Karim Hussein, a, um, one of the patriarchs of families that I've written about, he, you know, he... It's he, partly by necessity as a younger population, then, that, that mm, many of that the is, That has the being... energy and the, you know, the ability yeah. to work. Um, and it gets back to also these questions of disability, is that, that often the work that is available to do will destroy your body. And I was, you know, I was trying to emphasize this in the session on waste I did yesterday, is that people are not oblivious to this. They real, there's, I, I remember in an Oklahoma City housing project once hearing a woman named Corian Brother saying, saying, you know, I may not make it, but I'll die trying. And it, I heard that as sort of an anodyne language, like a cliche, but I think about it all the time in my work now around the world, is that people are dying trying. There's one character actually that um, just in, framed by your question about the, the young characters that appear and emerge. And there was one character that I found a peculiar torture in reading, the character of Minu, um, who appears and then commits suicide by swallowing rat poison. And I did think then of the, uh, uh, a criticism that was leveled against Thomas Hardy when he wrote Jude the Obscure. I know it's not compare, mm -hmm. fair to compare it with fiction, but T.S. Eliot accused him of turning the screw. I did think then, Please, you know, <laughs> this is too awful. She appears and immediately dies. Did we have to? Mm. Why? Why? Oh, well, she's, well, first of all, she was Manju's closest friend. And so Manju was, you know, was, she, she appears throughout the book because she was the confidant of Manju who was going through, who had realized some of the things that her mother, Asha, had done to But did you wonder, uh, you know, oh, you might overwhelm your reader? Yes, with, but, you know, but here's the thing. Here's the thing about nonfiction is that, Three of the people that I was writing about died in quick succession. And you think, like it was just, and, and for me it was, a, it was just, you know, it was a, it was a period of true, and, and sometimes almost catatonic depression. And they died in three different ways. And so maybe it's not the moment, it's two thirds of the way through the book or, or three quarters where maybe you wish that you could. When David Hare did the play, out of it, he was like, "There's, you know, let's just get rid of one of the deaths." But if each of the deaths tell you something about something essential about the communities in which, so so Mina, um, Mina was a uh, Dalit, and she had been uh, she had been against her will. Um, she was being sent to a marriage in a village that she didn't want, and she chose to die instead. So that you know that that story isn't just a story about one person; it's about young women's um, lack of control over their destinies at the same times in which they're watching television that shows the new empowered women of India and they see what they're, you know, what some people have and they don't. It, you know, so it was a, a, a bitter sense of inequality that she had in her ability to shape her life. And then there was another death that was a homicide covered up by the police. So like it's, that's the kind of thing you, you wrestle with. Is Lots of questions are now bouncing up. Um, I did point at you earlier, so I feel it's fair to come back to you. And then can we get, um, can microphone people just kind of get to people so we don't have a pause in between? So keep your hand up. So I, I haven't read your book, Ida, although like the other gentleman, I, I intend to. <laughs> um, you said two things uh, in the course of this interview really arresting uh, for me. One of them was that you said that the solutions like microfinance are very non-threatening, very convenient mm. for, the, for the vested communities. And then you also said that uh, they didn't necessarily correlate to what people in the communities themselves wanted. And then you also commented that left to themselves, though these people are competing with each other for these tiny, fleeting, ephemeral advantages. Mm. I'd be really interested to hear whether you have anything to say about the kind of things that people in the community are thinking and would be good for them, and whether you think there's actual wisdom in there, or whether you think that's something which is just a reflection of their condition. And it, it, th there's, there's a tremendous amount of wisdom in these communities about how to make their lives better. I mean, if you even think about access to, um, you know, people are aware that the water in their community is making them sick. It's, they're aware that um, their children may not grow to full height because they're constantly stepping on shit everywhere they go and that shit travels upward. So people have a tremendous awareness of public health issues like jaundice and malaria and dengue um, that, you know, and, and on the books they're supposed to be, and, and tuberculosis, and the books are supposed to be really effective um, ways of intervening in communities and, and, and solving some of these problems. When somebody dies of tuberculosis, it's supposed to create this apparatus where the next the people in the slum next, slum at next door are tested in the slum. You know, all these things are there. There's so many good and thoughtful um, ideas for, for 
giving people a healthier environment, to name just one. They just, there's no feedback loop from the poor communities um, so that when it doesn't happen, um, somebody ha is aware and somebody actually pays for that failure. Mm. Um, um, yeah. Tomorrow, yes, somebody's got the mic already, that's good. Thank you for what sounds like a very brave piece of work and I'm definitely going to read it. One of the, uh, this is following on from your comments that the, such a book hasn't been written before. Uh, one of the comments I've heard people make every now and then is that it would be very difficult for an Indian journalist or an Indian writer to write such a book because they would be much more subjected to pressures like harassment from the mafia or political pressures in Bombay, the Shiv Sena, et cetera. And a white writer going from outside is a bit more privileged and protected mm -hmm. from those pressures. I just wanted to get your view on what that means and if there's any truth in that. I, you know, again, it's, it's hard to say because there's no control group. But what I will say is that I, I was absolutely harassed by Shiv Sena and by the police and other. So you had didn't, all sorts of tanglements with the yeah, police. Exactly. You? Yeah, exactly. So it wasn't <laughs> that. Did cop some um, trouble but, as well. But the other thing that was, you know, is, is that people didn't, you know, people didn't necessarily take me seriously because I, I walk differently than other people. My hand looks different than other people. And so there was that kind of thing. Um, I will some say. Parts where they even teased you and kind of were rude to you. <laughs> they, would, you know. they, would, they learned that my legs were made of a lot of metal and they said that they would cut them off and recycle my metal parts. <laughs> and they got sick of me. Um, but the other thing is that people, like there was, there was a, a, a man that I had followed for a long time and eventually he said to me, you know, I'm tired of talking to you. Um, I'm going to wait till a real journalist arrives. <laughs> and it was just like, I was like, I'm the real journalist, but he couldn't conceive that I was yeah. the real journalist. But you raise a very valid point because mm. it's tricky days for journalists in India. You know, they're subject to a number of different political mm. forces and, um, you know, but still, you know. But I mean, it, also it, you it, have, you have the opportunities there. You have the amazing book by Amin Sethi, A Free Man. It's a book that I love. It's quite different than mine about a, a, a labor who's basically given up on you know, on capitalism in a Delhi slum. And so there's, you know, that book, that, that I, I see that book in some ways as a companion piece to mine, and he shows so certainly that, that it could you. be done. There's a question from a lady here, and then the gentleman in the front here, please. Okay, it sort of, it follows on that question, but more about how you technically sort of write something that's mm. nonfiction with a journalistic approach, but is so deep. Um, so starting with for representation, did you speak their language? So there's the issue of translation and mm -hmm. all the cultural symbolism that might be right. in their language, which you then represent um, in your book. H how do you manage that? So the, the, this book would not have been possible without the involvement of Unity Tripathi, who was a, um, she, she's now got a master's degree in sociology. She'd never worked in Islam before, but she had an amazing respect for people, all kinds of people. I tried traditional translators, and they had, um, they, they often were not comfortable. It was, a, it was a, a situation where you might be interviewing, and there were rats going past you, or something like that. And, and there was, there was disease, there was tuberculosis. So, 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 certain the people that I tried to use at first were not able to make the individuals feel comfortable. They ended up making the individuals feel worse. And she worked with me for three and a half years on the project, and then um, continued to work with me in the community afterward. Um, my own, and she had an intense um, and precise understanding of the uses of language, and she spoke four different, five different languages. So I had, a, I had my own understanding, but it was never going to be, of, of various languages, but it was never going to be the level of precision um, that would allow people's sensibilities to come through their own words. Um, and you know, again, her, her, the book wouldn't have been possible without, without her commitment to it and to the people in the community. A question here. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to pay a tribute to you and the Aga Khan Foundation for the compassion that you have shown about the sufferings, sacrifice, and struggle of these people. But then on the other side, there are the rich who are exploiting them, or mm -hmm. perhaps there are groups that include the chief center. Mm -hmm. What are your remedies? Do you think it'll be a worthwhile to make an all-round approach to relieve um, the oppression of these people and the sufferings of these people by working with charities, 
the government departments, with international bodies, writing more, um, not on just, just journalistic level, but on reports, regular reports. There must be some sort of strategy. After all, India is a prosperous country at the moment. Mm. But like England, as Orwell said, there are lots of people who are not really looking into the interests of the common people or the exploited. Mm. Well, I, I should say, you know, this is the premise of my work, that, that, that empathy alone isn't going to solve this problem. You know, there is no real empathy without, I think, a recognition of, of equality. And it's not going to be saviors. It's going to be uh, citizens. But I don't see my role as a journalist as, as, as saying this is what, especially you know, a Western journalist, oh, this is what India should do. Let me tell you, that hasn't worked very well in the past. Mm. And um, I'm not going <laughs> to be a part of it. And what I can say is this is what's happening in those communities. And I think one of the best responses that I got um, to my book when it was published in India was from people who've worked for a very long time on issues of inequality and justice, um, access to water, public health. And they said, this section in my book helped my argument in when, I, when we had these discussions in Delhi. Um, that people could take some of this reporting and say, this, see, this is what I've been talking about. And um, you know, how, how, how India, how any country reforms itself, it's, it's, um, it's not my job to say. What is, what is my job to we've, say is what's going on in the community. We've got time for a few more questions. Uh, there's one here and one here. Oh, first of all, I'm really excited about your book. I can't wait to just go and get it. It sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. um, one thing you said is quite true. We know a lot about, or what we think we know a lot about poverty is through our house means. Mm. And what surprised me actually is what you spoke about the dis difference between men and women mm -hmm. and how men can often be broken by the age of 30 or 35 and alcoholism quite yeah. is, is quite a strong uh, side. You'll, uh, you'll see it in my book, yeah. But what do you think that women of today, women of the world outside of the slum in Mumbai can learn from the women of there? What can we learn about their strength or creativity? What is it that makes them so different to survive in such difficult conditions? Um, I think that, first of all, let me just say that I think there is a way of, of romanticizing hardship in low-income communities that, you know, there's like, oh, look at them. They survive so much. See how strong they are. And there's, an, there's a sort of a sub-theme to that is like, oh, they must not really feel pain in the same way that I, with my, you know, my exquisite emotional network, um, feel it so you know and it's like you know it's like people saying in the you know in the community um, people people when I was when I was distraught at the deaths that I talked about people were like ah, you know some people were like oh well, it doesn't matter you know they they get many other lives so they're not really feeling it I'm like hell yes they're feeling it so there's a way but but what I learn from what I pers I learn a ton from the people that I work with and one of the one of the things I learn is um, is about, yeah, I think about when Zaranisa Hussein, an amazing woman that I write about who has nine children, will, at the time when her husband, her eldest daughter, and her, her son, eldest son, were arrested and um, imprisoned on charges that hundreds of people knew that they weren't guilty of because it was a crime that happened in a public space. She had a two-year-old son and she had kids and she, the bottom had fallen out of her world and she, she still had these kids and she, pulled up socks and she sang to those kids and she made those kids feel love and she laughed with those kids and, and that ability to separate a, a tragedy in the name of her children was something that I found profoundly moving and I think about when I have my little problems I'm like you know mm -hmm. pull up your socks because think about what I you know I ask myself what would Zeranisa do? Yeah. Yeah. So. What would Zeranisa do? There's a question up here. Hi, thank you so much for today and for your session yesterday. I was going to ask a question about mental health. Mm. Um, and you mentioned Dongri. Mm. Um, I've been to Matunga mm. in Bombay, which is where boys end up after mm. having been through the Dongri process. And I work with an organization that's working with these boys. And you know, just this week, there was a, a boy who tried committing suicide. Um, and that kind of level of helplessness, mm. because there's you talk about the resilience and you talk about the the capacity to cope and to move on or to to deal, but the challenges of mental health, particularly with these young boys who mm. 
don't have anywhere to turn, the institutions are failing them, the society's failed them, their families have failed them, they feel like they failed everyone else around them, is so intense. And I just wondered... Like, well, let me just throw out the other thing, which is, which is as true in London as it is in Mumbai. Um, inequality leaves a body count. What you have in... I mean, when, when you talked about the death of Mina being unveiled, there are two suicides in... in it is... I mean, right now, I know kids in council housing who are going to get access to Wi-Fi and look at the Instagrams of people who are having beautiful vacations right now. You know, they will spend five hours a day looking at what other people have. Um, we, are not, we are only beginning to wrestle with the toll of inequality on people on the losing end of it. It's much easier to talk about poverty because you know, charity can fix it. But when we talk about inequality again, it implicates the rich. And there's, you, know, you, see, you see the suicide counts in India right now. It's that poverty is rising, and so is suicide. And that's not an accident because inequality in many countries, including my own, is the worst that it's been in 40, 50 years. And the Which people on the losing end of that, read. Mm, the yeah. people on the losing end of that, that's gonna, not an abstract to them. We're going to fit in one more question. Sorry to be a bit accelerated. We're fitting yeah. one more question. Um, in your book, you mentioned that the, there was a threat of being the slum being bulldozed. Mm -hmm. Do you know what happened to the slum today? Like, has it been bulldozed or what? No, it's still there. It's still there, and it's still under threat of being bulldozed. But part of the thing about when you write about one slum, it's only they're going to save it to bulldoze to last because oh. they feel that there are people in the world who are watching that, which doesn't mean that, um, and you know, unless that means someone else got bulldozed. Right, exactly. Didn't get written it's about. like you don't really say, oh, that makes me feel good because. Yeah. I'd like to end on a sort of wider political mm. note, um, which is about the, 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 the kind of work that you do when you write about excluded people, people who don't have a voice, um, is accessing a world that we're seeing reflected in the unusual sort of electoral uh, results around the world. Mm. I mean, people, we, we keep being told that, you know, us urban liberal elites who go to <laughs> literature festivals don't understand people that vote for Donald Trump. And we keep being told that, you know, this lack of understanding is a, a critical factor mm. as, as society becomes more divided. And I just wondered if you could reflect on that with, you know, the way that, that um, leadership has changed and how that's mm. a sort of reflection on people's anger and, pe and, and inequality. Can you reflect on that? Yeah, you know, I mean, maybe I'll just take this part of it, which is that even though the people that I write about are are stereotyped and dehumanized, I'm really interested in the process of dehumanization and why it happens in certain times or not, and you know, times that aren't times of war. war. And one of the things that strikes me is the, is the political um, efficacy of dehumanization. Well, you have Donald Trump just last month talking about Mexican immigrants as am animals. You have, um, you have Modi's sometimes incendiary comment on, on uh, people who, who are not Hindu. I think why? It's right now, there's, there's, there's not enough work to go along around. There's not enough labor to sustain dignified lives for everybody. So if you're a politician, what are you going to do? Are you going to talk about this desperate situation and try to, to wrestle it to the ground and solve it ima imaginatively, honestly? Or are you going to just disqualify a huge hunk of your population from consideration so that you have a smaller problem to deal with? And I think that, um, that that's what we're seeing a lot of. We're seeing rhetoric that says that, you know, that, that some people are worthless. They are beneath our ability to, they, first of all, that they're irredeemable. Um, you know, brown people, black people in my country, you know, or um, they are so morally suspect, potential terrorists, whatever, that, that, um, that they are not worthy of our consideration as human beings. Um, and one of the things that's, that's so painful to me, and I think that, that social science has, has ratified this over the last 50 years or so, is that that, that political rhetoric spreads, it radiates. You see some, you know, I remember a, a, a 1975 study at Stanford that said, you know, when, when a supervisor used dehumanizing language about a person, individuals uh, gave them more painful shocks, like in an instance. I mean, it, the, you, we are really, you know, it turns out that we humans are, are really susceptible to um, the idea of, that other people lack the value that we possess. Mm. Um, 
and that's a very frightening thing. And, and right now, um, all you know, all the rest of us can. You know, you're talking about as your housemaid, and you know, we, we can think about for ourselves the language that we use to describe other people and, and what we what we um, are representing to uh, to children, to the, the way that we talk about people who have less than us. And it's my firm belief that luck is um, is the central. Um, often luck of work is the central um, determinant of social status. It's not about skill and you know, I, I try to think about whether your language in talking about other people, you who have the luxury of, of being in a literary festival and not working on this beautiful day, um, or trying to find work, um, think about, you know, <clears throat> think about your language and um, your assumptions. And um, I, you know, and I, I guarantee you that when you do that, um, the world is going to become a less scary and more profoundly amazing place, even if it's also going to be clear that it's a more unjust one. It starts with us. Yes. Mm -hmm. I want to say, you just mentioned the word dehumanization. This book is the opposite of dehumanization. Mm -hmm. Catherine Boo spent three years up to her neck in toxic <laughs> sewage so that you could buy this book, everybody. <laughs> a huge round of applause for Thank you, Catherine Boo. Thank you.